Hello and welcome to the latest Royal Roundup from Talk TV. So pop the kettle on, this is The Royalty. I'm Sarah Hewson. A day of royal health shocks on Wednesday, as it was announced the Princess of Wales was in hospital for abdominal surgery. And shortly afterwards, it was revealed that the King was also due to be admitted to hospital for treatment for an enlarged prostate. We'll have all the latest reaction to that, plus the Queen's fury at Harry and Meghan over the naming of Lilibet. Joining me to discuss all of that and more, a royal commentator and Talk TV regular, Afia Hagen, and chief royal correspondent for Newsweek, Jack Royston. Hello to both of you. Hi. Now, the Princess of Wales will spend up to two weeks in hospital after having successful abdominal surgery. It was revealed by Royal Aids on Wednesday, just as it was also announced that King Charles will attend hospital next week to be treated for an enlarged prostate. It was an extraordinary double health scare uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, wasn't it, Afir? Within something like 90 minutes, yeah. these two announcements, firstly from Kensington Palace mm -hmm. and then from Buckingham Palace. Yeah, and us getting actually quite a lot of detail and also not getting a lot of detail at the same time with both those statements. Uh, with the statement about the Princess of Wales, uh, we got details about the, the length of stay in hospital, which hospital, the London Clinic, she could be there for 10 to 14 days. She won't be taking up any royal duties until after Easter. The rest of her recovery will be taking place at home. And at the end, you know, she apologised for postponing uh, events and hoping that they can be reinstated in due course. And then know when it comes to King Charles III, uh, he, him being treated for an enlarged prostate. Uh, we were told that we got that level of detail because he wanted to raise awareness about a condition that's quite common in men over 50. Perhaps it will encourage someone somewhere to check their own prostate. It is quite a common condition. So yeah, I mean, in those two hours, hot off the press, these two statements, um, meaning that three out of four because the mm. Prince of Wales will be looking after the Princess of Wales and of course they're three children. Uh, so three out of the four most senior royals will be out of action for the next couple of weeks at least. I mean that's really quite something isn't it Jack? You mm. think that the King is going to be out of action. He's cancelled engagements uh, today, Thursday we're recording this, Friday and also as he recovers from the procedure which we know is a, a pretty routine and, and common yes. procedure. The Prince of Wales is cancelling duties to support his wife and look after their children. And the Princess of Wales, as Afia was describing, is going to be out of action till at least Easter. It's a big Three chunk of time. Three yeah. the most senior members of the royal family out. Absolutely. So obviously a burn is going to fall on Camilla, um, who we're expecting to continue doing royal duties. So yes, she's, she's got engagements on Monday. Uh, she's got engagements see. coming up, exactly. <laughs> so she will keep working. And obviously it's just a greater burden on her. It's a greater burden on Prince Edward and Sophie, the Duchess of Edinburgh. It's a greater burden on Princess Anne. So these royals are obviously going to be carrying that weight. But then there's also the question for William about how long he feels he can give it before he has to start going back to work. Now that's a big decision for him to take and it may also have some echoes of the past for him because obviously there was a time when King Charles was um, making similar decisions about how much time to spend supporting his children during a period of tragedy. Mm -hmm. um, you know he will have to, <laughs> William will have to be reassuring George and Charlotte and Louis that everything's okay and that mummy's fine. Um, he's, he might be reminded of some of the ways that Charles sought to reassure him and Harry in the days after Princess Diana's death. Mm -hmm. Yeah and, and of course 14 days in hospital <coughs> in this modern age of medicine is a long time, isn't it? And while we rightly don't know the details of the Princess of Wales's uh, condition, and that remains private, pretty clear this is major surgery. Major, and it's gonna be a lifestyle change. You know, anything that takes three months or so to recover from, you know, her lifestyle during those three months is going to be very different to what she's used to. Um, there's obviously a huge amount of anxiety and nervousness building up to an operation. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways it's tempting to think that the hard bit has been done. But um, waking up from a health incident like this and finding that you can't necessarily do the things that you're accustomed to being able to do for yourself mm -hmm. is hugely disempowering. So mm -hmm. she's going to be having uh, some experiences to cope with along those lines as well. Um, and that's where I think William kicks in. He'll want to be giving her as much help as possible, but also she will, I'm sure, want to be starting to look after herself for her own feeling of kind of empowerment as well. Mm. And in the statement we have from Kensington Palace, they recognise that there was going to be a lot of concern. Yep 
following this announcement mm -hmm. about the Princess of Wales's uh, health. Um, some reassurance in that they have let it be known it is not a cancerous condition mm -hmm. that she's being treated for. The operation described as successful. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of emphasis placed on this word planned, yeah. a fear that it was planned surgery. Yeah. She wasn't rushed into <coughs> hospital for emergency surgery. Mm. And, and then many people have asked me and, and said on social media, well, if it was planned, why she had to cancel engagements? And I've been asked that question a lot as well. And, you know, there was obviously a sense of planning. This could have been something that occurred perhaps this time last week or, you know, over Christmas. Last time we saw uh, the Princess of Wales was at Sandringham on Christmas Day. Over that period, an illness could have occurred, which meant that she sought medical advice. And the medical advice was, it's a good idea for you to have this surgery. This surgery needs to take place. This will be your hospital state. This will be the length of time. So obviously there has been some sense of planning in there, mm. but something can be planned four days ahead, five days ahead, a week ahead if something is necessary. She wasn't, you know, blue light into a &E, it wasn't emergency surgery. It's obviously something that perhaps they didn't foresee in August or September when they were planning out the diary for the next three months, but there has been some kind of planning in there. I also because think that... it should have been quite a busy period of time, shouldn't it? <clears throat> yeah, them? so the, the period around Christmas and New Year would obviously be less busy. And then as you go into January this week is actually when things usually start to mm. take off again for the Waleses and when Kate and William start start doing engagements. So mm. I think she would have had a, you know, there would have been a period of time where she didn't need to tell people. Um, what you've got to bear in mind in terms of the cancelling of the engagements is that the minute they start cancelling them, mm. there is a risk that it leaks. Exactly. So they will have wanted to leave it as late as possible. <laughs> So Charles right now has obviously told us a week in advance of his procedure, but he's also taken the decision to tell us what the procedure is about. Now, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because in the past, when you think about the late Queen and, and the Duke of Edinburgh, we got very limited details. Mm. They were admitted to hospital. Their privacy was maintained. We didn't get the full specifics mm -hmm. of their condition, and understandably so. The King's taken a different approach to this and decided to be very upfront about with what's happening. About a part of the body that some people find very embarrassing to talk mm. about. So mm. he's... And maybe, maybe that's why, you know, yeah. maybe it's just about normalising it. This is a very common condition mm. for men over the age of 50. Again, they were quite insistent Half to say... Half of all men over yeah. the age of 50 were yeah. experienced. And it's, same. again... It's benign, so non-cancerous. And so I think maybe it's about normalising mm. it. It's about saying, you know, this is something that's going to happen to over half of men in the UK. If I've got it, you might have it. Get yourself checked. You never know without trying to sound too dramatic. You, he might save a life. Yeah, and you will sort of wonder as well whether perhaps he might be sitting there thinking, gosh, I really wish I had got clued up about this mm. a little earlier in my life, because you can make lifestyle changes. Um, with enlarged prostates, so if you kind of stop drinking alcohol or you drink this, you drink this coffee, coffee's another one. There are various lifestyle changes you can make um, that can mean that having a procedure of this kind isn't, isn't necessary. And also why it's important to seek advice early is that the symptoms that you will experience with an enlarged prostate, and in the King's case, it is very common and it is benign, but those symptoms can also be indicative of something more serious mm. and hence why it is important to get checked out early, rule out anything else and then get the treatment uh, you require. There are medications out there that can certainly help before having to have interventions. But what happens when the king does go into hospital at Jack? Who's in charge? Well, he will, I have been assured, be able to continue wholly fulfilling his constitutional function of, as a monarch, monarch. So there are two types of royal duties basically there are those that, that have to be performed by the monarch which is what we call the constitutional function and then there are the more kind of relaxed charity events and things that the royals do in order to kind of show lead by example and show us how to be good citizens so i am assured that charles will be able to continue performing that constitutional function despite this operation and that there will not therefore be a need for prince william to kind of act up as king um, during this period, which is probably a huge relief for him because obviously he's got a lot of his plate on the moment. Well, yes, because we've been talking about the role of councillors of state. Now, yeah. should a monarch be taken ill for a short period of time, there are councillors of state mm -hmm. that can step in and those mm -hmm. are the spouse yep. of the monarch and the next four in line to the throne, although actually uh, now we've had uh, Princess Anne additional. and Prince mm -hmm. Edward added to the list because it was somewhat problematic, including Prince Harry, Harry and, and the Duke of York in the list. Um, 
But we're assured, as Jack has told us, that that's not going to be required in this case. But it is an argument for the councillors of state. You know, you, ha you do have the two additional ones, like you said, uh, Prince Andrew and Princess Anne, the Princess Royal, uh, who were added in 2022. This is the type of situation that if um, King Charles was not able to perform that constitutional function even for an hour, and perhaps Prince William couldn't because he was looking after the Princess of Wales, who is next? It's Prince Harry. And it's um, two councillors of state that have to act. Yeah, it would, so it'd be together, Prince Harry and Prince, An Prince Andrew, both of whom are not working royals, one of whom doesn't even live in the country. Mm. So perhaps it's time to really look at those councillors of state, farm up your top four, as it were. You do have Queen Camilla in there as well, but farm up that top four so that if you are in this situation, which actually we're probably closer yeah. to than we've ever been, the, you know, before. Mm. It's time to firm those up and maybe it's time to do some swapping in the order. I'm not saying you get rid of Prince Harry and Prince Andrew. Perhaps it's time to bump up Prince Edward, Princess Anne, the Princess Royal, uh, and Princess Beatrice, so that they are the ones who could take up these positions. Because like I said, both of them are non-working royals. One doesn't even live in the country. Mm, it I is going to require, sorry, oh. uh, Jack, it is going to require a greater degree of stepping up if they've even got time mm. yeah. uh, for Princess Anne, who we know is one of the hardest working royals already, uh, the Duchess of Edinburgh, the Duke of mm. Edinburgh, for example, picking up some of those engagements and others will have to be shifted to later on in the year. Yeah, I think many will probably have to be postponed. I mean, you know, there was talk of William and Kate visiting Italy, mm. um, going to Rome, potentially going to the Vatican, could have been potentially meeting the Pope even. So I would think that they would be hugely disappointed if that had to be cancelled altogether. So it then becomes, well, when's that going to take place? Um, it would have been their first kind of official, formal royal visit since they became Prince and Princess of Wales because they, they have been abroad for the Earthshot Prize and relate, events related to the Earthshot Prize, but those are not classed as kind of formal kind of state visits. Not on behalf of the Foreign and Not on behalf yes. of the Foreign, yeah, exactly, of the Royal Visits Committee. Um, so, you know, these are big events and um, they, you know, something is lost if they're scrapped completely. So it, it will be a lot of work, I think, for courtiers behind the scenes to try and look at diaries and trying to think what is mm. the timescale actually here? You know, where there's, it's one thing to say that the Princess of Wales is going to be back working after Easter. It's another thing to be say to say that she's going to be up to travelling overseas. Um, yeah. And in an ideal world, uh, they certainly wouldn't have wanted to have the three taking time out at exactly the same no. time. But I suppose it's just a reminder, they are human, mm. they are fallible. And yeah. health comes first. Health yeah. absolutely comes first, yes, and we wish them both all the very best. Two weeks in hospital, though, as we said, uh, for the Princess of Wales. Um, but this isn't your average hospital, uh, no. is it? The London <laughs> Clinic. Pretty luxurious. I was looking on their website, more like a five-star hotel. They offer a, a concierge service. They'll even book you theatre tickets or travel. I'm not sure the Princess of Wales is going to be... No. Uh, utilising that service. But uh, perhaps some other members day. of the royal family might nip into the West yeah. End. And, <laughs> and also the food. The food looks incredible. I was incredible. about to say, yeah, they do. They had some great reviews for their scrambled eggs and smoked salmon. Mm. And, and she's not the first royal to be treated there. In fact, the late Duke of Edinburgh, Prince Philip, had exploratory yes. abdominal surgery there back in 2013. But uh, yes, as I said, we wish them all the best. Let's talk about Harry and Meghan now, because the late Queen Elizabeth was apparently infuriated by the Sussexes' claim that she'd approved them naming their daughter Lilibet. That's according to a new book. In 2021, Harry and Meghan announced their daughter's birth and said in a statement that she was named after the Queen, whose family nickname is Lilibet. However, a new biography by royal journalist Robert Hardman has said the late Queen was as angry as I'd ever seen her, according to AIDS, after the couple stated she had been supportive of the name. Um, this story has attracted a lot of headlines, uh, Jack. It doesn't paint Harry and Meghan in a good way, does it? But how, how much... Do we read into this? Was it the name she was angry about? Because well, well, Giles Brandreth had claimed that she was saw, took it as a compliment. 
Or is it more around the, the, the row that ensued afterwards? So a lot has been focusing on the row that ensued afterwards. So what essentially happened was there were some noises in the British press about whether Harry and Meghan had got the Queen's permission to mm. use Lilibet specifically, because obviously that's the nickname rather than Elizabeth. Um, there was then a briefing clearly from the Sussex camp in a couple of newspapers, The Times, People, Vanity Fair, suggesting that they had. Um, this, it is suggested, was what upset the Queen, um, who felt that she hadn't been asked. You know, it seems that Harry telephoned her or had a, had a meeting with her over Zoom um, and told her that that was their intention, but didn't actually explicitly say, is that OK? Would you rather we used Elizabeth? Um, this appears to have upset her, but also the key thing, if you read the Giles Brand version and you read it very carefully, mm. it's not completely different, but it is written with, let's, uh, I mean, it's slightly more palace if you know what I mean. Mm. Um, they've said that she, Charles Brand said that she took it with a good grace um, and took it as the compliment that it was intended to be. But it does, see, it does seem from his version that maybe there was some discomfort. And then in the Robert Hardman version, it's slightly more extreme. So he says that a palace staffer said he was, she was as angry as he'd ever seen her. Um, one thing that does strike me, though, is that there was a briefing to the BBC, clearly from the palace at the time, mm. clarifying that she was ne she was never asked. So clearly she was upset about that aspect of it. But... And then she was sort of pulled into it because apparently mm. the Sussexes asked <clears throat> the palace to back up right. their version of events. And you can see how that would have... Mm riled her, getting drawn into a tit-for-tat mm. between the Sussexes and the BBC. And I think that's probably what would have made her angry because the Queen never, you know, said anything, really, if you think about it. She re maintained that cool exterior. She would have hated to have been drawn into, like you said, the tit-for-tat, the kind of arguments that he said, she said, surrounding this thing. And I think that's what would have made her incensed, is the fact that she was now being asked to be drawn into this argument. It's a deeply personal nickname, though, mm. wasn't it? It had come from her own inability to say her name. As a child, As yes. As a child. Yeah. It was one that was given to her by her father. Yes. Um, and there was a claim in the, the Daily Mail this week that she'd said, I don't own the paintings, I don't own the palaces, all I own is my is name. Is my name, which is hugely powerful. Mm. It does also give me a certain degree of discomfort about some of how this whole argument has mm. become so public because the, the Queen obviously had the capacity, had she wanted to, mm -hmm. to put her anger into the public domain in more forthright terms back in June 2021 when Lilibet was born. And she chose not to. Yeah. And so now we have this briefing basically quoting her directly so in the mail. I mean, discretion was her middle name. Discretion yeah, was her middle name. And um, I, I mean, sorry to cut you, I actually think she would be in the sense that so much of what she apparently said is now in the public domain. Because this that was just her wasn't her. Yeah, yeah this exactly. was her power is that we never knew what she thought about exactly. anything. Exactly. And so posthumously, after she's died, when she's not here to express an opinion, um, we've got all kinds of people basically saying what she thought and what she felt. I mean, let's be honest, there will be a lot of people within the palace who are not fans of Harry and Meghan and will have felt some discomfort at their use mm. of that very yeah. personal name. There have been many other relatives who've been given the middle name Elizabeth, for example, but not use Lilibet. But not use Lilibet. And in all honesty, I do have a degree of sympathy around this. I think basically for people in the palace, it chimes with a general perception that Harry and Meghan are just constantly in PR broadcast mode 100% mm. of the time and that nothing is sacred and that nothing is out of bounds to them. Um, so I have some sympathy with that p position and the feeling that perhaps it's been said before that courtiers are very aware that some members of the royal family will try and kind of bounce the queen into agreeing to mm. things rather than genuinely find out whether she wants them or not. Um, on the other side of it, though, this is a two-year-old girl who's going to have this name for the yeah. rest of her life. Yeah. And she didn't choose her parents and she has no control over their actions. And, and I'm she's like, been dragged into the headlines around now. She's dragged into the headlines and she's two years old. Mm. She could very easily wind up in a situation when she's older where her friends at school are Googling her, finding these stories, and she's yeah. getting bullied at school over oh, yeah. them. Yeah. Um, Robert Hardman's book also includes claims that the palace are fearing the wrath of spare Mark II. Mm. 
There's a deep intake of breath <laughs> <laughs> from the other side of the room there. Uh, one aide apparently commenting that the headwinds we face from across the Atlantic are not over. I mean, Harry actually talked about stripping out pretty much half of the book, didn't Honestly, he? Honestly, I think that a lot of what was stripped out of that book would have been a very good idea to strip it out, not only for the reputation of the royal family, but probably for Harry's reputation too. I mean, there is stuff that went into that book that I 100% would have stripped out to yeah, spare yeah, yeah. Harry yeah. <laughs> before you even consider the royals. So, uh, you know, there are, I think what's going to worry them is the idea that he has all of these bullets that haven't been fired. Um, but also he needs to be incredibly careful because America has lost its patience with him constantly returning to the same story. And what Harry and Meghan really need to do in America now is relaunch them themselves and show that they have more to offer than simply banging the same drum, um, attacking an institution that Harry claims that he still supports, which mm. is very contradictory. And what they need to do is actually put their money where their mouths are and in, a, in Hollywood, in California, prove that they have talents that do not simply arise from the fact that Harry was born a royal. But remember that Harry said in the interview rounds when he was talking about Spare that this was the last of the Look Back projects. Mm. So this was after Harry and Meghan, the documentary on Netflix, then we had Spare and he said that this is the last of the look back projects. This is the last of the things that we'll be talking about, them deciding to step back as work, working royals and everything that happened after that. So I genuinely don't think that the palace have anything to worry about when it comes to Spare Mark II. But we have heard that there is a deal, a six book deal with Penguin. We've had one book, what are the other five going to be? Could there potentially be um, a book from Megan. Megan. Mm. And and also, but like they said, this could be the last, that, well, they said that those are the last of the look back projects. The next books we might get from, might be chil a children's cookbook. It yeah. might be, mm. do you know, mm. a, a yeah, book yeah, yeah. of their favorite shoes. Do you know what I mean? I think that you're right in saying that now is the time for them to forge their path and put out content and things um, that they really care about, that tie in with Archwell and their um, philanthropic mission. And I think they will do that. Um, one other story that's generated some headlines to come out of Robert Hardman's book is around Prince William and Faith mm. and whether he could decide not to be Supreme Governor of the Church of England when it's... he succeeds King Charles as sovereign one day. I mean, that's quite a, mm. a claim, big. isn't it? That's big. It's very big. Um, Centuries it... of tradition. And it has some echoes of the 1990s because Charles had a period when he wanted to be defender of all faiths rather mm. than defender of the faith. And it caused a massive hoo-ha. And there were simultaneously, there were some uh, members of the Anglican Church who were doing interviews uh, on TV and saying how terrible it all was. And it turned into a big argument and it, he pulled back from the brink. Um, he, there was a point when, bizarrely, a, a Buddhist woman was repeat calling Buckingham Palace and managed to get through to him at some point, managed to convince them to put her through to Charles. She very nearly con persuaded him to convert to Buddhism. Wow. Um, but He's all a very of this, spiritual man, isn't he? He's a very spiritual man. And his attitude to spirituality does lean slightly towards that Eastern idea about inner world work and kind of like focusing internally and he got very frustrated with Christian dogma and um, he got frustrated with the arguments that senior figures in the Church of England were having about you know scriptures and so on. Um, William the accusation is slightly different it's that he just is a modern man mm. and modern Brits goes, are to, not... <clears throat> goes to church for christenings and weddings yeah. and Easter, but Easter, and, Easter and Christmas Day. Day. yeah, yeah. Um, and the old look, coronation. Mm. If he were to try to go through with it it would you know, virtually be at constitutional crisis mm. levels. Um, I suspect that he will just simply have to pull back from, from the brink as his father did in the 1990s. Mm. Yeah, I, I think to talk about him no longer being Supreme Governor of the, the Church of England is, is a step further, isn't it, than actually he, he just doesn't share the same faith perhaps as his grandmother yeah. and father yeah. might have and that same relationship. <laughs> with the Church of England. And if he feels that he doesn't have that same faith and, and he can't genuinely be the supreme governor of the Church of England, he wouldn't be he wouldn't feel honest that he was doing that. Wouldn't we rather that someone was upfront about that and said it with their chest that I don't think I, I respect can, the institutions but I but I cannot take on I... this role. And you know, um in Hardman's book he also talks about the fact that he or Prince William sees his main role as 
bring up Prince George to be a great future king. That's where his mm. focus is, um, which I think is, you know, a great idea. But if he feels that he cannot genuinely do the job, then maybe he shouldn't do it. Now, you can now listen to the royalty as a podcast. So if you prefer <sighs> to keep us in your ears only, or if you miss an episode and you're busy on the go, you'll be able to catch up wherever you get your podcasts. And talking of podcasts, the latest episode of The Queen's Reading Room aired earlier this week. Now, some eager listeners may have noticed one particular similarity with this show. That is the royal tea theme. And here is The Queen's Reading Room. Hello, welcome to The Queen's Reading Room podcast. The place where we invite lovers of literature to share with us some of the bookish treasures from their own reading rooms. Spot any similarities? There's obviously not enough royal music to go around. I would like to think, a fear that perhaps we've inspired Absolutely. the Queen for her Absolute. podcast. Absolutely. I think actually we were all the inspiration for, <laughs> for most of the things the Queen does. I think now she should invite us on the podcast so we can all enjoy the royal music together. And then come on this podcast. And absolutely, <laughs> there is a seat there waiting for you, Queen Camilla. That is all we've got time for this week. Uh, my thanks to Afia and Jack. And if you want to join in with the debate, please leave a comment and make sure you subscribe if you don't want to miss a single episode. We'll be back next week with all of the latest on the Royal Family. We hope you can join us. We'll see you then.